If it's Wednesday, President Biden tries to jumpstart his stalled climate agenda, while the administration weighs declaring a national emergency as heat waves scorch the U.S. and Europe. Plus, missing text from the Secret Service, some new witness testimony, and new targets in a criminal inquiry. One of the latest developments is the January 6th committee and Georgia prosecutors ramp up their dual investigations into President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. And if Republicans are poised to take back control of Congress, why is it that it's the Democrats raking in the bigger campaign cash halls in key Senate races? We're following the money and what it means for the midterms coming up. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Chuck Todd. It is good to be back after a little rest. Today, President Biden delivered a speech on climate change. It's an issue he calls one of the administration's top priorities and Democrats call one of the country's greatest concerns. But it's arguably the latest hot button issue where the administration's words are more forceful than their actions, in part because the president and his party are confronting a chilly political reality. There just does not seem to be an actual sense of urgency on Capitol Hill on this issue. It's a lot of hot rhetoric, but not a lot of hot action. And there likely won't be until the public actually demands it. And overall, the public isn't. Earlier today, at a former coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts, President Biden announced a series of executive actions that he was taking, including a proposal to increase offshore production of wind power, additional funding to protect communities from extreme heat, and energy assistance for low-income Americans. Climate change is literally an existential threat to our nation and to the world. So my message today is this. Since Congress is not acting as it should, and these guys here are, but we're not getting many Republican votes, this is an emergency, an emergency. And I will. I will look at it that way. I said last week, and I'll say it again loud and clear. As president, I'll use my executive powers to combat climate, the climate crisis in the absence of congressional action. Well, the president did not actually declare a national climate emergency, which some environmental groups had hoped for and, uh, and some progressives had been lobbying for, although the White House says that move is still under consideration. Now, what that actually means, if they did do it, is a whole other story. Today's announcement comes less than a week after Senator Joe Manchin appeared to reject the fellow Democratic Party's uh, plans to include climate provision in the president's stalled domestic agenda, although some Senate Democrats do remain hopeful that Manchin will eventually get behind something on this issue. And it really depends which senator you talk to to decide whether this is totally dead in the water right now. Meanwhile, the public is watching images like these. This is parts of Texas on fire amid the current heat wave. And this morning, the White House's National Climate Advisor, Gina McCarthy, says the president is moving ahead with environmental initiatives regardless of congressional action or inaction. I mean, Congress will do what Congress does. And so hopefully if they get around and they can manage to do it, more actions on Congress would be helpful. But the president is no longer sitting around waiting for that. This is his time to act. And he's going to take that time. So we are going to take strong action. The president is going to announce those actions. And you'll see them rolling out over the next few weeks. Another hurdle facing the administration, convincing the American public that climate issues demand their full attention. It was a bit demoralizing for a bunch of climate activists was this poll result last week where just 1% of Americans called climate change the biggest issue facing their families. That was according to a recent Monmouth University poll. You can look in a lot of polls and you see similar numbers. Just 2% of Americans told Gallup that they believe climate change is the country's most important issue. And even among younger voters, voters under the age of 30, just 3% say it's the biggest issue facing this country. That was according to a New York Times Siena College poll. So unless those numbers go a lot higher and unless people lose a race for Congress, sounds familiar, right, on the gun movement, when you lose on this issue, it is hard to see Congress moving anytime soon to take significant and lasting action on this issue. And obviously we have one more giant problem with tackling this problem. When only one political party sees it as an urgent issue and the other one doesn't, Nothing gets done. It is how the system works, uh, at least it, the way it works these days. I'm joined now by Mike Memelies at the White House, NBC News senior national political reporter. So Hill Kapoor is on Capitol Hill for us. So, Mike, boy, you know, there was a, there was a lot of repetition about this speech today. 
Um, yes, it, although the subject was different. You could have replaced the words climate with abortion. And we've seen this speech, I think it was a couple weeks ago, right? You could replace, you know, we could go down the line here on other issues, replace the issue. It, it's sort of like, well, here's what the administration's going to do. Think about voting rights, I think, is another one to throw into that category. Is that the way to look at this speech and, and these actions today? Well, Chuck, I, I found a number of things about today's speech really interesting as you think about the political moment that the White House is in. The first was, this is exactly the kind of speech that for too long critics both inside and outside the White House feel uh, he's been giving at the White House, by whether because of COVID or because he's been constrained just by the demands of his time by a number of other commitments, especially the foreign summits he's been doing lately. So this was a uh, show-don't-tell kind of speech for the White House. Get out there, make a clear linkage between climate, which is a top priority for the Democratic base, and link it very clearly to the economy, which is a top priority for voters overall, talking both in the beginning and the end of his speech about both the harm that climate change is uh, resulting in the economy, disruption of supply chains, uh, reduced work productivity. And then he ended his speech by saying, look at the kind of jobs that are created in, by the way, coal towns, hello, Joe Manchin, uh, that are now being converted into clean energy jobs. So that, I think, was an interesting dynamic. Second, you have the president, you noticed he never once mentioned Senator Joe Manchin today. Obviously, that would be mm -hmm. probably a mistake when he needs him for whatever is going to come next in terms of even a smaller uh, Build Back Better package. But President Biden has been extremely frustrated, and he said this both publicly and privately, of the fact that as part of the messaging issues this White House has had, too much of the discussion is about one or two Democrats who stand in the way of his priorities and not enough attention, right. and this is a message to the base, on the fact that, as he put it today, not a single Republican in Congress is supporting his climate agenda. This is something that President Biden and a lot of White House officials I talk to, as they hear all, taking a lot of incoming fire from activists in the base, they feel it has wasted time, wasted energy. This should be yeah. directed at Republicans now in the midterm elections, especially on climate, but especially on abortion, an issue they think could give Democrats a real advantage this November and instead yeah. has become part of a circular, circular firing squad within the party. Well, uh, glad the White House is noticing now this has been a problem for about a year and a half as Democrats seem to want to, uh, Democratic leaders in Congress want to attack other Democrats uh, more than they seem to want to go after other folks. Uh, Mike, one other question on this national climate emergency. It would essentially allow him to use money the way he wants to use it on a few things on, on renewables, maybe some investments, maybe on some oil and gas leases. Is that, is that worth, is that something, it feels, this feels like it would be something they would do to sort of appease the interest groups to say they're doing something, but there's not a lot of action that would come with it, correct? Yeah, it's really interesting, Chuck, because I actually looked up what the Progressive Caucus in Congress has called on the president to do with a climate emergency declaration. And as a White House official pointed out to me today, he's already done some of the components of that through the invoc invocation of the Defense Production Act, for instance, to try to further mm -hmm. jumpstart uh, domestic energy, especially green energy production, solar panels specifically. And so this is a question the White House has been sort of posing back uh, to activists, to other Democrats, when they say you need to, de de to declare an emergency on X. What do we use that emergency power for? Right. And in many cases, the White House feels like they've already done things with short of declaring an emergency. And then, Chuck, you get into this larger concern that this president specifically has, which is after Donald Trump used so-called executive uh, you know, emergency power uh, to, it, as a workaround of Congress, he does not right. want to be doing the same. He does not want to be laying the pretext for other Republican presidents down the road to do the same. So they want to use this emergency power, very targeted ways, very yeah. careful ways, whether it's climate or abortion, which uh, there's some reporting about as well. Well, you could end up with the problem of sort of emergency fatigue. If you start to exactly. declare everything an emergency, then what, what is the real priority? Mike Memoli getting us started at the White House. Mike, thank you. Sahil, uh, Capitol Hill, climate's dead. No, it's not dead. Mansions, we're not working with them. Yes, we are. Clear it up for us, buddy. Where are we right now? Well, Chuck, I would say climate funding is in purgatory right now. It is not going to be a part of a near-term reconciliation bill. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is only going to have two components because the only two components that Joe Manchin is willing to support at this moment are drug pricing, empowering Medicare to negotiate prices, uh, a $2,000 cap you know, on out-of-pocket costs for Medicare, 
two-year funding of ACA mm -hmm. uh, enhanced subsidies so premiums don't go up this fall just before the election. That is all Manchin is willing to support. And in terms of climate, what my sources have told me is that Manchin has conveyed to Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, that he is he wants to wait until at least August 10th when the next inflation report comes out. And if those numbers are improved, then he might be willing to do climate again. Now, there's a lot of ifs in there. Democrats don't trust him at this point. Democratic leaders have negotiated with him for months and months and months. Many, uh, you know, question whether he ever had an intention of, of getting to yes on this. And the fact that he explicitly laid out uh, several components of a slimmer bill after rejecting Build Back Better that included taxes, included climate and energy, included health care uh, and deficit reduction, and he's not willing to do several of those. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of pessimism and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of frustration among Democrats. So it's not alive is the best way I can answer your question. But there may be some hope, some hope somehow that in, in August or September, uh, Manchin will change his mind. But few, few Democrats are holding their breath for that. Sahil, have you gotten a better understanding of why it's clear that someone, it wasn't Manchin that wanted to be seen as pulling the plug. Uh, it was leadership that decided to make it seem as if Manchin pulled the plug. Have you gotten to the bottom of why that decision was made? Because it does seem like some other senators weren't ready to throw in the towel yet. Yeah, a couple of reasons, Chuck. The first is that ACA subsidies uh, are drying up soon, and uh, Democratic leaders had consulted with experts who believe that if a reconciliation bill to extend that money wasn't passed in August, then insurance companies would have to send those notices of premium hikes out in October. Now, think about that. Millions of Americans on the ACA uh, who support Democrats, who like this law, seeing their premiums go up weeks before an already difficult midterm election for Democrats, that is one problem. And the second is the fact that uh, Manchin was citing inflation as the basis to hold off on climate when counterinflationary or non-inflationary policies were the entire justification of this new negotiation after he killed Build Back Better. He had, he had suggested that climate and energy funding, as long as it was deficit reducing and paid for, would not be inflationary. Now he's suggesting inflation is a reason uh, not to move forward with that. So there's just questions about whether he will ever get to yes. And at this moment, Chuck, uh, Democrats are eager to take the wins they can. Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill for us. Sahil, as always, sir, thank you. So joining me now is the NOAA administration. That's, of course, the National Oceanographic uh, Association. Essentially, our climate, I guess unofficially, the person that uh, oversees at least the tracking of our climate here in America. It's Rick Spinrad. Uh, and Mr. Administrator, let me, I, I want to focus our interview on the solutions business. A lot of climate coverage is always focused, frankly, on like how bad things are. It's only getting worse, and we're do it seems doomed, right? And I guess the question I have is, can we start to make incremental progress if we don't have a national climate policy? So thank you for that question, Chuck. And I think the short answer is absolutely. And we do that by providing information that decision makers can use uh, to make decisions about uh, cooling units, about different policies for agriculture and transportation. And so there is an all-of-government effort. And I would point out from day one in the Biden-Harris administration, we've been coordinating cross agencies to provide products on things like heat health, to provide uh, products that help local communities be more resilient to sea level rise, to be more resilient to changes in precipitation and uh, extreme storms. So we are seeing that coordination. We are providing products. A lot of it is aimed at adaptation and resilience in conjunction with efforts associated with mitigating climate change through decarbonizing and use of renewable energy. But there's a lot of action going on right now in the administration. So there's some talk of the idea if he declares a national climate emergency and what that really does, it just allows him to move money that was not essentially appropriated by Congress to deal with things that are climate related and essentially use that money for that. If you had a bigger pot of money, Mr. Administrator, what would be the first couple of places you would use it? Well, I think it's all about understanding what the needs are of the various communities and users and industry sectors. Uh, and that is where talking with agriculture, transportation, energy, commerce comes in to learn what the needs are. And the National Climate Task Force, under the leadership of Gina McCarthy, is doing just that. And what we have done is we've identified the risks, the risks in terms of fire, drought, flooding, uh, coastal resilience, 
extreme heat and heat health. Those are the areas where we're making investments. And part of what you saw today from the White House was uh, announcements of specific investments uh, in groups like FEMA with $2.3 billion uh, associated with uh, the BRIC program, which is intended to provide local communities the information they need to be resilient to climate change. You saw uh, investments within health and human services to provide low-income families with the guidance they need to get the cooling, the air conditioning that they want. So it's really defined by the risks. That's where the priorities of investment are. Well, when you've got this sort of the, the risk issue, at what point do we get into the incentive business? Meaning, you know, you, you essentially because it's pretty clear you're never going to get the public to agree to, hey, spend money now so that things are less bad later, right? That is just a, it's an equation that you're just not going to do. But if you tell people they'll save money on their power bill, all of a sudden, and hey, we'll, we'll use that as a way for you to get, you know, this was a very popular thing to do in the 90s and the early aughts. And I feel like we've gone away from that. Um, it, uh, that seemed to be things that would get bipartisan support, for instance. I don't disagree that the economic incentive is an important one. And I think when you start talking about property values and how uh, informing people of the consequences of climate change on property values, that's the sort of thing that gets attention. But I would argue, look at what's going on right now. We've got 100 million people. We've got a third of our country right now under a heat advisory. 200 million Americans are going to see temperatures over 90 degrees between now and uh, and Friday. In the I-95 corridor, uh, the whole corridor will probably experience temperatures over 100, 100 degrees in the next several days. People do care about these things. They're concerned for their own health, for their own uh, livelihood. People care about the elderly and their children and how these kinds of impacts will affect them. So I, I wouldn't undersell the role that the administration is playing with respect to addressing the heat impacts as well as the economic impacts. I, I'm sorry, I mean the well, health I mean impacts in addition to the economic impacts. No, and in fact, you know, I'm glad you brought this up. A thousand people are estimated might die this week in Portugal due to extreme heat. This is direct deaths to climate change. Now, unfortunately, we thought the fear of death would get people to do the right thing during a pandemic. Um, is it alarming to you that we are, we are literally seeing what many people warned about 20 years ago, that essentially climate change is going to kill people? And we're going to see it near term. And we're seeing it this week in two continents. Um, is it alarming that this is not so, sort of sobering up policymakers and the electorates? Of course, any loss of life is alarming. And I think the, the point here is that the tools that we are developing have already had beneficial uh, consequences. If you look at the result of improved forecast, improved skill and forecast in terms of people mm -hmm. taking shelter from severe storms. And we know we're going to be seeing uh, more severe storms. And in fact, we're about to enter the heart of the hurricane season for uh, yeah. our population in the southeast and the Gulf states. And so I think we ought to look and see that uh, we have made progress. This administration has made these kinds of investments. I can assure you the kinds of investments I just alluded to will result in lives saved and protection of people and their property. So I'm quite confident this administration has the protection of our population and the property uh, that we own uh, foremost in our minds. Uh, Rick Spinrack, the administrator of NOAA, which is uh, housed within the Commerce Department. Uh, administrator Spinrad, thanks for coming on and sharing your uh, views and perspective with us. Thank you. Up next, Democrats face the limits of their power in Washington on the issue of climate change as they test the limits of their patience. With Joe Manchin, we'll speak with a Democratic senator in the thick of the debate about what happens next on this issue. Plus, we'll have the latest on the saga over the missing text messages from January 6th somehow magically were deleted by the Secret Service as federal officials and the January 6th committee try to get to the bottom of what happened, why it happened, and whether it was nefarious. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we've said, President Biden's climate remarks this afternoon follow last week's news that Senator Joe Manchin was not ready to support climate provisions in a reconciliation bill due to concerns about inflation. It's, of course, just the latest time that Manchin's slimmed down what he is willing to accept in a reconciliation bill. 
In the latest time, the West Virginia senator has angered many of his fellow Democrats. Obviously, he's Democrat vote number 50, so he holds a lot of sway. Other senators don't like it. Senator Bernie Sanders went as far as to say that Manchin has, quote, sabotaged the president's agenda. Others publicly, again, have been voicing their frustration as well. But Manchin says the door is still open for future climate negotiations, and some Democrats have backed off last week's criticisms, saying they believe they can still work with the West Virginia senator. I just think we have to take Senator Manchin at his word. He says it's not off the table. I am disappointed in his uh, attitude toward the need to address climate change, but he seems to be going back on that, so we shall see. I think we can still get a climate peace done at some point in time, which is just as essential, and I don't think Chairman Manchin has said he's given up on that. Do you think he should have been clearer on his positions earlier? This is not about the past. It's about what we're going to do going forward. What matters is not casting blame. What that sounds like is they had a come to uh, some sort of come to you know what meeting, uh, lunch meeting or breakfast meeting that morning when they came back to the Senate this week. Democratic leaders now say they will accept Manchin's slim down offer on drug pricing and health insurance funding and leaving climate for another day. Joining me now is Democratic Senator from New Mexico, Martin Heinrich. Senator Heinrich, it is good to see you. And let me start there. There was a lot of anger last week. It sounds like you guys had a family meeting and, and calmed down and everybody said, hey, we may be mad at him, but he's still a member of the Democratic family, uh, meaning Joe Manchin. Is that a fair way to look at things this week? You know, I think there's just a recognition that we have to get as much done for the American people as we possibly can. Uh, but having lived through the last year in my state where fires have raged in a way that I have never seen before in my life, uh, where the Rio Grande is drying, where our, our reservoirs are empty. There's still a huge amount of frustration. And, and I think if we take Senator Manchin at his word, that this is about uh, inflation, we know that 41 percent of the inflation that we're seeing is directly tied to increasing prices in fossil fuel commodities like gasoline. And then that ripples through the entire supply chain. So we're trying to find a way forward that recognizes that it really is our addiction to fossil fuels that is driving the out-of-control frustration and, and inflation that our constituents are feeling. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that there should have been a separate climate bill? I understand for procedural purposes it was eventually going to have to be lumped in together because of this 50-vote necessity. Uh, that that the Senate, the way the Senate works these days, and I'm not gonna, we're not going to debate whether that's a good idea. I think a lot of us know that this is uh, also difficult. But I, what's hard to sort of grasp here, Senator, is what is the climate bill? It's always been part of this other bill. And I do well, think that maybe that gets to a little bit of the uh, problem that, that folks have had in getting the public's understanding and backing of this. How would you describe the climate provisions as a standalone bill? So the, the, the heart of this are really the tax incentives that will drive forward uh, industries like wind and solar, industries around clean hydrogen, uh, lots of other technologies like storage that we already know how to do that are here and ready but need to have their costs driven down so that they really take over the, the market in a way that, uh, that really squeezes carbon out of our entire economy. And honestly, I think that every bill we do, whether it's an appropriations bill or whether it's a mm -hmm. policy bill, we need to be doing climate all the time now because as you've seen from not only Texas, the Southwest, Europe, um, it, we've reached a point where our climate is truly at a tipping point. We're, we're losing this battle and losing control of the weather and we need to be acting with every single opportunity, whether that's the administration, whether that's Congress, right. whether that's state and local leadership. Does uh, declaring a national climate emergency, is that relevant as far as you're concerned it, for policy? I think it is because there are certain authorities and we saw just how, uh, how far authorities can be taken under the previous president. So I have urged the president to do that. I think we saw a good first step from the president today, the announcements that he made. And I'm hoping that that's just the first salvo in a long list 
of executive actions that can make a meaningful difference in decarbonizing our economy. You know, there's a bit of a philosophical debate within the Biden administration on executive actions, and it seems to be the president is hesitant to push the legal envelope and essentially put ex actions into the hands of the courts. Um, others are arguing, hey, push the envelope and see what happens, uh, you know, make the courts rein you in. Where do you stand on this? Well, I think as long as there are not 51 votes for decisive uh, climate action in the Congress, in the Senate in particular, um, I think it, that it's really incumbent on the President of the United States to step up and lean in and, and make sure they do their homework so they're not inviting a defeat at the courts. But we need to lead now, and we need to show the American people uh, the, the sort of decisiveness and the action that people are really clamoring for. Well, let me talk about the public. You know, it feels like the concern about climate is there, but it's not front of mind. It's sort of like, it's like the concern that I have that my roof doesn't leak. You know, when it's leaking, it's a front of mind concern, right? When it's not, sure. you know, hey, I always got It does seem as if the electorate isn't there yet as seeing this as a front of mind. Maybe that's due to inflation right now. And, and until that's tamed, we're not going to get other issues. What's your sense? Well, and I, I think, once again, it's really important to realize that the reason we're under these inflationary pressures is the incredible dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, and the wild commodity price swings that we see with things like gasoline. So, you know, in, in a few years ago, you couldn't find a climate conversation on any of the major television stations. And I'm doing multiple interviews a day on climate now. So I think there is a shift. People are recognizing, at least the people who are going through these extreme circumstances, but inflation mm -hmm. is also a, a critical, critical issue. And we need to connect the dots and say, well, we're going to solve inflation with, uh, you know, with a climate bill that is going to bring down the cost of energy right. for consumers and switch us over to cleaner, cheaper sources of energy. And I, it seems as if it's that first part that you just said, that if you're going to incentivize that at the end of the day, the public doesn't want to spend more money for progress down the road. They've got to feel it in the short term. That's tough to deliver both, Senator. We, uh, honestly, I think we have a package uh, that we put together that is um, going to save people money and is going to buffer them from these fossil fuel price spikes. And so I, I think the, what's missing is the recognition that the solution to many of our inflationary issues uh, really is some of the policies that are in that, that climate bill. Senator Martin Heinrich, Democrat from New Mexico, and as he's pointing out, New Mexico is seeing, seeing it front and center uh, with these horrible wildfires that they've been dealing with. And Senator, appreciate you coming on, sharing your Thank perspective. You. Still ahead, Ukraine's First Lady makes a personal plea to the United States Congress for more weapons and resources in their fight against Russia. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. For weeks, Russian missile attacks have been targeting apartment buildings, stores, and other non-military targets in central and southern Ukraine. It was the strategy they deployed at the start of this war, and it is continuing. Today in Kharkiv, a Russian mil uh, missile uh, strike killed three people, according to the governor there, including a 13-year-old boy who is waiting at a bus stop. Some of these images are disturbing, so please keep that in mind. And if you want to look away, this might be the time. The boy's father can be seen kneeling and mourning beside his son's body. Today in D.C., Ukraine's First Lady, Olena Zelenska, delivered remarks to members of Congress, describing the suffering of civilians in Ukraine, sharing personal details about the children and families killed by these Russian airstrikes, and asking lawmakers for more help. While Russia kills, America saves. And you should know about it. We thank you for that. But, unfortunately, the war is not over. The terror continues. I am asking for weapons. Weapons that would not be used to wage a war on somebody else's land. 
but to protect one's home and the right to wake up alive in that home. Her remarks came a day after the White House detailed Russia's plan to annex Ukrainian territory in the east and the south by forcing residents to apply for Russian citizenship, making the ruble the official currency and installing proxy government officials to hold sham referendums. My colleague Peter Alexander has already spoken exclusively with Ukraine's First Lady after she spoke to members of Congress. She spoke about how the war has affected her family and her country. What does your son dream of? What does he want to be? Obviously, he wants to be a soldier. He wants to be a soldier. Obviously. That's what all Ukrainian boys must dream of now. I think, yes. What does that make you think as a mom? You know, before the war, my son used to go to the folk dance ensemble. He played piano, he learned English, he, of course, attended sports club. And now I cannot bring him back to doing arts and humanities. Everything, on, then only thing he wants to do is martial arts and how to use a rifle. And that's what I really want um, to ensure, is that the childhood of my son is given back to him and that he enjoys his life to the fullest. You can see a lot more of Peter's exclusive interview tonight in the NBC Nightly News at 6.30. And then we're going to have the extended version of a longer conversation Peter had with the First Lady tomorrow night, right here on Meet the Press Now. Up next is the Secret Service keeping too many secrets. Welcome back. According to a letter sent to the January 6th committee, the Secret Service says it is simply unable to turn over a single relevant text conversation to the committee from that trove of messages that were deleted on January 6th. And moments ago, the committee put out its response, telling the agency that federal laws may have been broken and that every effort must be made to retrieve the lost data. Basically, you better go back and check again. The committee subpoenaed records from the agency after a letter from a DHS watchdog revealed there were deleted texts between agents from January 5th and 6th. Secret Service says the texts were erased as an accidental impact of a pre-planned upgrade to agency devices and maintained it went into action before the data request from the DHS investigation. Today, we here at NBC News have also learned that the agency told employees in two emails, including one before January 6th, to back up data from their cell phones before the phones were factory reset in the upgrade and that it was the responsibility of individual agents to make sure they followed through on that direction. Odd decision to make it uh, agent specific there. Employees were then sent a third email on February 4th instructing them to save all communications specific to January 6th. Why that email didn't come sooner? Another question. At that point, though, multiple congressional committees had already asked for Secret Service communications from that day. So, what's the real story? We're going to break all this down with The Washington Post reporter Carol Lenning. But first, I want to get an update on the other investigation into Donald Trump from my colleague Blaine Alexander. She's following the grand jury investigation down in Fulton County, Georgia, where a judge ruled today that former Trump attorney and ally Rudy Giuliani will have to testify as part of that probe. So, Blaine, this is the criminal investigation where the former president may have the most current exposure, although we don't know whether... DOJ is investigating him under under any criminal intent yet. But what do we know today about this news and and where where do things stand right now in the Fulton County investigation? Well, Chuck, what we know is that this investigation is moving quickly. We know that there are a number of developments. We've seen a number of court motions flying over the past few days, and we know that it's expanding. We're kind of getting more insight into this investigation over the past couple of days or so than we've had since its inception. So let me start with Rudy Giuliani. We know that a New York judge actually is the one who's ruled that he has to come down here, and he's given a specific date. He said August 9th he has to come down and testify before the special purpose grand jury. What was supposed to happen is he had a hearing, a separate hearing in New York, where he was supposed to go and essentially argue why he shouldn't have to comply with the subpoena. The judge says that Giuliani never showed up. That's what prompted him to issue this order. The other thing that we know is that there's a different kind of pool of individuals that the Fulton County DA is looking at, those 16 electors, fake electors as they're called. Uh, they have also been informed that they are now targets of this investigation. What's notable, though, is the shift in their status. Before, according to their attorneys, they were just witnesses. They just believed that they were just witnesses, but now they're 
their targets. That kind of shows that the DA is essentially, Chuck, doing exactly what she told me in an interview not too long ago, making sure that she hears from, in her words, every person who has insight into the president's, not just his actions, but she says his knowledge, his mindset, any sort of information around how he was uh, thinking or acting regarding the alleged election interference here in the state of Georgia. She says she wants to do a robust investigation, and this latest bit of filings shows that she's doing just that, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it sounds like what you're describing is the outside-in approach. Ultimately, we're trying to figure out what did Donald Trump know and do, so she's starting with the widest uh, possible uh, scope of people to talk to. Let me ask you this. Lindsey Graham apparently is now going to testify. What else do we know about that? We know that he's accepted this. Uh, he's going to accept the subpoena, but it doesn't mean that he's not still going to fight it. In fact, earlier this morning, he was supposed to have a hearing uh, in South Carolina. He had, you know, filed a motion to quash the subpoena in South Carolina. If he decides to fight it here, it's now going to be before uh, a Georgia judge. But at the heart of it is what the Fulton County DA hopes to hear from him, which is essentially uh, learning more about the two phone calls that he made to Raffensperger, asking about absentee ballots, and according to his subpoena, whether those could be altered to essentially move the election in President Trump's favor. That's something that she says she wants to hone in on, along with the other Trump associates. Uh, and it really just kind of establishes this pattern of wanting to talk to people who were doing any sort of activity around or, or in regards to or on behalf of the president after uh, the election uh, back in 2020, Chuck. And really quickly, Blaine, one other thing. Is there... Um I've not heard a lot about Mark Meadows. I assume he's been subpoenaed. What What is the status of his, um, I guess, relationship with this investigation? And I think that's a great question. We know so far the people who have been subpoenaed, but that's not to say that there aren't more to come, right? When I spoke with her, she made it clear that there are a number of additional subpoenas to come. She's not ruling anybody out, including former White House officials, including members of the president's family, and including the president himself. Uh, we do know that there's a long runway, though, before she has to wrap up this investigation. It can be in panel gotcha. for about a year. Uh, so she has until May of next year before she has to kind of wrap all of this up. So certainly a, a lot to look for still, Chuck. Boy, some important context there, Blaine. She has until May of next year um, with this grand jury. That is an important piece of calendar news, if you will. Blaine Alexander in Fulton County for us. Blaine, as always, thank you. Uh, and Carol, we want to make a small correction here, uh, clarify something I said at the top of the segment. Secret Service informed the January 6th committee it was able to turn over just one relevant text conversation from the time period around the insurrection, which, of course, almost makes it even sillier. So, Carol, um, there's a lot of people that look at this, and if it walks like a duck, and if it looks like a duck, and it sounds like a duck, they obviously have an idea of what happened here. Um, are we ever going to be able to know for sure what happened to these texts and why they appear to be magically gone? You know, Chuck, the problem for the Secret Service is twofold. One, it's a mess because they allowed individual agents, as I reported yesterday, to make a decision themselves about what to upload from their cell phone when they reset these phones in January, coincidentally, January of 2021, just days after the insurrection. Critical evidence, agents were allowed to decide for themselves, and it turns out they decided not to back up and store these old cell phone texts. Um, Carol, can I pause you there? Well, that would have potentially been very relevant. It's, sure. They're not the only government officials who carry phones that are government-owned that have to follow these rules. I hear about it all the time from my sources. Hey, you know, that I can't text you back here because of this, so all of this. Um, is this the only agency that was given personal, essentially that kind of personal license? Or is this how the entire federal government works when it comes to archiving information on government-owned devices? You know, as I've talked to sources throughout federal agencies, they're shocked that the Secret Service was allowed to make this discretionary decision, that agents were allowed to have this amount of discretion. They're really stunned by that. It fits the pattern, however, of the Secret Service, which likes to keep secrets, would have been totally happy to have a bunch of stuff vanished in the sense that they don't really want to share their internal materials. Uh, and that doesn't mean it was nefarious, however, to eliminate 
incriminating or exculpatory evidence involving January 6. It just means the agency is used to sort of getting away with murder and nobody holding its feet to the fire about it flouting uh, rules day and night, honestly. Um, I have found and I have read many Secret Service texts and I can see why some of them would like them erased for good because a lot of uh, the texts that I've read were pretty salacious. They were personal in nature and they showed a lot mm -hmm. of people goofing off uh, and engaging in some extramarital <laughs> activity um, while on the job. So I can see the issue. However, your central and serious question is, is this copacetic? And the answer is no. Is will we ever know if this was nefarious? That depends on how seriously the inspector general for the Department of Homeland Security has right. so far looked into this or will. This depends on Congress and how hard they push. And it and now depends on whether or not there's going to be a demand for these phones, the old phones, and some creative ways to try to recover. I've been yeah. hearing from techies for two whole days all saying, you know, I can I can find the backup for that. I can re recover and restore that. Mm. I think that it will be challenging, but it, it really depends on um, those three elements. I can't help but wonder about the role Mr. Ornato played here. Um, and it was just this unusual relationship where a, a basically former high level Secret Service member became a political appointee in the West Wing and serving as a go between. I mean, every it does feel as if the lines were really blurred here. Um, it, it, who who would investigate Mr. Ornato? I don't think he falls under DHS. Well, he's about to retire this month if he hasn't already. Um, so I don't think he'll be a U.S. Secret Service or executive branch employee for very long. But you're absolutely right. He crossed uh, and the people who authorized his move, the president of the United States, Donald mm -hmm. Trump, and uh, the director of the Secret Service, Jim Murray, who's also now leaving. Both of those authorized a move that Secret Service agents have never seen, taking an objective civil servant and putting them in a White House political role. Uh, it illustrates everything that's wrong with the Secret Service today. And it is, it is going to make it where no matter what the Secret Service says about these missing texts, there's always going to be uh, a big seed of doubt, um, thanks to Donald Trump. Anyway, Carol Lennick, who uh, probably reports on the Secret Service more than any other reporter in Washington. Carol, thank you. Up next, if it's Wednesday, we got some primary results, some of them, if you will, because of how long Maryland will take to count their votes. It's a race where Democrats are hoping to pick up a governor's seat. We're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Let's turn to the midterm elections. Votes are still being tallied in Maryland, but NBC News can project some of the results, particularly on the Republican side, since the Republicans don't use as many mail-in ballots. The Trump-backed candidate, Dan Cox, uh, we project, will win the Republican gubernatorial nomination when all the votes are counted. Cox appears to have topped Kelly Schultz. She was the candidate. The term-limited Governor Larry Hogan, who Cox once tried to impeach, by the way, was supporting. We're still waiting for the mail-in votes to be counted, so we don't know the Democratic nominee will be just yet. But with Republicans nominating a Trump acolyte who chartered buses to Trump's January 6th rally in Washington, our friends at the Cook Political Report have already moved their characterization of November's race to solid Democrats. In a tweet, Hogan blamed Trump for losing the governor's mansion in Maryland, writing this. Trump lost Republicans, the White House, the House, and the Senate. He's selfishly colluded with national Democrats to cost us a governor's seat in Maryland, where I ran 45 points ahead of him. Joining me now is Maria Teresa Kumar, president and CEO of Voto Latino. She's also an MSNBC contributor and Republican strategist Brad Todd. And these results are coming. There's a new Quinnipiac poll where basically everybody stinks, if you want to look at this poll. Joe Biden's approval rating, an abysmal 31%. Republicans in Congress, their job ratings at 23%. Democrats uh, in Congress, their job ratings, oh, a robust 30%. Um, Supreme Court is the shining, the tallest little person here, if you will, standing at an approval rating of 37%. Um, Brad, this has made this midterm Everybody is angry at everybody. I don't think we're headed for a typical midterm election, but it doesn't mean we know what the results are going to be. Well, and of course, that survey did also. You left out the media on there, too, Chuck, who wouldn't ring in at a very high number either on approval. We uh, never do, buddy. <laughs> 
You're looking at a brake pedal election here where Democrats have full control of government and the voters are going to correct that. It, whenever you have the trifecta, the House, the Senate, and the presidency, there's always a pretty big uh, Great brake pedal on that, and Joe Biden's failed on the inflation front with the economy, and so you'll you'll even get a larger brake pedal than normal, I think. But Maria Teresa, the one thing that normally happens in a midterm for the out party is they 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 have a new car smell. They let you know, hey, we're not what we used to be. That is not what we're seeing this time. The Republicans are offering it. it, it they've not remodeled or remade themselves, which to me it looks like we're going to have a referendum on both parties. I mean, I think you nailed it. I mean, they, it's not even that they're a, a new car smell. They don't even want to acknowledge that Americans across the board want to do electric vehicles. I don't know if you saw the exchange yesterday, but it was brilliant between Buttigieg and, and the Texan. So, look, I think that, Chuck, you are absolutely right in the sense that we are going into this midterm, and it is a coin toss. This is not a traditional election, precisely because if there is a MAGA Republican against a Democrat, it's going to be the Democrat that wins. I'm, and the reason I say this is that we're seeing this in Maryland and we're seeing it in other places. There's a lot of independents, a lot of Republicans who don't feel comfortable what MAGA represents. And it is being used, going to be used by the Democrats as a turnout tool because, yes, inflation could be high, but MAGA Republicans, what it represents for families, for people of color, is dangerous. And what I mean by that is that when there was, a, whenever there was a MAGA rally in any city during Trump, they would experience, and it was a multicultural city, they would experience anywhere from a 10 to 12 percent increase in reporting of hate crimes. This is really personal, and it's not business as usual because it's asymmetrical. Now, if you're talking about a moderate Republican like a Mitt Romney, for example, I know he's not running, but for example, then that's when the races become a lot closer. But not when you have someone that is, when you have MAGA Republicans who are so controversial and who are not playing within the democratic sandbox so to speak do you accept that analysis brad that that basically the the more maga you are the harder basically the harder it is to win a swing election well in maryland for instance the democrats spent big money to try to get dan cox the nomination because they're terrified they would lose a governor's race in maryland so they tried to pick the candidate they thought was easiest to beat most of his funding came from democrats and so when democrats are worried about losing in maryland when you see them losing districts along the texas border that republicans have never held that are majority latino districts then you know that this is going to be a good election for republicans there's a new multi-ethnic coalition centered around work that the Republican Party is just driving the Republican Party today. And you're going to see that this November. Can I address that? <laughs> Go ahead, Maria Teresa. Yeah, I know we were on oh, a delay. You know, everybody's, so everybody's talking about the, the, the race that was won in Texas by a Latina who happens to be a Trump supporter. The second part of that narrative, though, is that Folks, the Democratic Party did not invest in that district because of redistricting. They know that it's going to be absorbed in in come November. So that is a small term limited district that's going to be absorbed in the, to the Democratic Party. And do the re Democrats have to continue investing in the Latino community? Absolutely. Are you seeing a defection of Latinos going into the Trump? That's not the case. What they are seeing is that they are demanding that Democrats do more because there is about 30 percent of Latinos who voted last time around, Chuck, for Biden. They're right. thinking of staying home. And that's where we need to close. And the other thing that we learned, because we, all this polling has uh, we haven't had coffee in a long time, Chuck, but we, we just got all this polling. <laughs> and one of the things that we also learned is that the number one reason that Latinos did vote for Trump last time around was because they thought that the COVID relief checks that he signed right. were we'll literally from him. So the trick, the gimmick actually worked. Brad, I want to ask you, what do you, uh, what do you make of the Republican Party's small donor problem, particularly in these Senate races? I am not, I am sh look, I'm not surprised that Warnock's out raising Walker. But when you see it across the board, it's anemic with a J.D. Vance. Chuck Rassley got out raised, not by a little, by a lot. But it seems across the board, what is your, is this a, is this a, Economic. I mean, the Democrats are getting plenty of small donors and it's a tough economy, but the Republicans aren't. What's your thesis? Well, you know, Democrats actually are the party of the elites in America. So, of course, they have more money. Uh, they, they have outspent Republicans in Senate races for eight or ten years now. It's pretty consistent. But Republican donors should wake up. Uh, if, if Republicans continue to get outspent, you know, you mentioned Georgia. Raphael Warnock spent $18 million on television. Herschel Walker spent two. The race is still tied. 
Uh, but it, it won't stay tied if Mitchell continues to get outspent. So the Republican donors should wake up and start uh, contributing their campaigns. Well, wow. it is one of those things, and I got to cut you both off here. I'm out of time, but it's why I find this midterm cycle is unlike any other we've seen. I think we are there. there there's so many cross currents um, to the historical trends that um, guess what? We actually have to wait till the voters vote. Brad Todd, Marie Teresa Kumar, thank you both. Uh, and thank you all for being with us this hour. NBC News Now coverage will continue actually right this second with my friend Allie Jackson. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.